Hello, I'm Gordon Palmer, uh, Minister here at Claremont Parish Church, and this is our service for Sunday, 18th July. As well as myself taking part in the service, um, Alison Ross is doing the signing, Helen Cuthbertson, the Bible reading, and John Collard is leading us in our prayers for others. God says, speaking to us in his word through the Apostle Peter, that God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is our God, a God who wants to see new life. And yet, and yet, we know that in the twists and turns of that, sometimes things are a bit difficult, and that will be part, that'll be our theme today. And a hymn that speaks of God's um, place and God being with us in and through the good times and the bad is where we begin our praise, Blessed Be Your Name. We'll join together in prayer and gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the words for that will be on the screen. Let us pray. Blessed be your name, you who are the Lord God, the God of sea and sky, snow, rain, wind, and flame, the, the Lord who is Lord over everything, Lord over all. We give you thanks and praise for the goodness of your creation, for the wonderful works, for the beauty and, and bounty of the world. Give you thanks for people made in your image, 
with minds to know you, hearts to love you, and wills to obey you. We give you thanks and praise that you're a God who is patient with us and with all people. Thank and praise you that you're a God who didn't simply destroy or throw away creation once it was spoiled. A God who has not given up on people after a first refusal. And indeed a God who has not been turned away by repeated indifference or or coldness on our part. Rather a God who is patient and loving. A God who is determined that your purposes would come to fruition, that your love would overcome, that your intention to bless would be realized, that salvation would be won, and the kingdom of God come in all its fullness. And so we thank and praise you that you have provided a salvation for us, You've not left it up to us to find you. You've not set us an exam that depends on our own interest in you, our own goodness, our own worthiness, but rather at enormous cost to yourself, you have provided your Son as a Savior. And we thank you for the death and the rising of our Lord Jesus, and that the risen Lord Jesus now with you in glory and send His Holy Spirit onto your church, onto your people. And so we thank you that you're not just a God that we hear about, but a God that we know. And yet, Lord, despite the wonder and beauty of your creation, despite the fullness of your salvation, despite your active presence with and among us, we still live in a hurting and in a sore world, in an unjust world, a world that very often confuses and puzzles us. But Lord, we pause before you to acknowledge that we have our part, we have our place in that. For we've not always listened to your leading. We've not always been faithful with the gifts that you've given us. We've not always been generous with our opportunities to care and love and serve. We've not always been thoughtful in how we use what we have. So, Lord, again, through Christ, forgive us. Forgive us, and now, through your Spirit, may we know peace and pardon restored. But might we know peace and pardon restored, not simply to let us off the hook, but to draw us deeper and more fully into your plans and purposes as we seek to obey you and serve you in all of life. And we ask that in the name of Jesus, in whose words we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil, the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. The reading this morning is from Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 1 to 18. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day, while I was sitting in my house, and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the Sovereign Lord came on me there. I looked, and I saw a figure like that of a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he was like fire, and from there up his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and in visions of God he took me to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court. 
where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, look toward the north. So I looked, and in the entrance north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing, the utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary? But you will see things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance to the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, Son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and saw a doorway there. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing here. So I went in and looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel, and Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand, and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say the Lord does not see us, the Lord has forsaken the land. And again he said, you will see them doing things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord. And I saw women sitting there mourning the god Tammuz. He said to me, do you see this son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. He then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there at the entrance to the temple, between the portico and the altar, were about 25 men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. They were bowing down to the sun in the east. He said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things that they are doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence? and continually arouse my anger. Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Therefore I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. Amen. We know only too well that churches closed down. Many people in East Bride came here from older towns, particularly Glasgow. And there they were part of congregations that were active, buildings were full, there was a lot going on. And yet years later, these same churches are closed down, the building has been knocked down or is lying empty or been reshaped into flats or a pub or something. Similarly, the other places of, um, <clears throat> of Christian fellowship and, and mission, for example, in the city of Glasgow, the, the tent hall, gone. And beyond that, there's denominations that have just simply fizzled out. Not long after the time of Jesus, Christianity gained a great foothold in places like in North Africa and in Turkey, only for that to be followed by centuries when we didn't know if there were any Christians there in these places. Now, why? Why does that happen? Why? Would God let it happen? Why does God allow places that were once full and bustling of faith and Christian activity just seem to fizzle out? Is he unable to do anything about that? Surely he wants his church to grow. Did we not begin our service with words from from Peter from one of his letters about how God does not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to, to come to him in faith? So why do these things happen? Why are there so many empty church buildings around the country? Similar questions were bothering Ezekiel and his fellow exiles. They had been forcibly removed from the land that had been promised to Abraham, 
and his descendants. They'd been forcibly taken from the city of David, the temple on which their rituals had centered, and they were saying, why has God done that? Why has he taken us to this place, Babylon, where we're under foreign rule, where we're hundreds of miles from the Lord's place? And in a vision that we read last week in chapter 1, God had shown Ezekiel that he was not God of a particular place, but he was the God of people. He wasn't tied to the temple, to Jerusalem, but in all his glory, he was in Babylon too. And Ezekiel was called to show and explain that to his fellow exiles. But now in chapter 8, the passage that Helen read for us today, in chapter 8, and it's now 14 months on from that first vision, and some of the leaders amongst the exiles are with Ezekiel, but are probably just going over this in their minds or in their conversation. What's going on? What's God expecting of us? What are we supposed to do in this mess? And as they wrestle with that, Ezekiel chapter 8 receives a second vision. And in this vision, Ezekiel is taken to Jerusalem. And he's given a tour in four stages, each moving more centrally towards the city and the temple and the Holy of Holies in the temple. In four stages, he is shown what is going on and what the Lord thinks about what's going on. Firstly, in verses 3 to 6, Ezekiel is stood on the outer courts of the temple. On one side of them is the way into the further into the temple. The outer courts was where even the non-Jews, even the Gentiles could assemble, even the women could turn up. But beyond that, into the Holy of Holies, it was only for Jewish men. And it was further going towards the, the presence of God in the very Holy of Holies in the center of the temple. But on the other side of Ezekiel, as he stood um, outside that northern gate, there was this idol of jealousy, we're told. And the clash is obvious. Where there should be one God, one faith, one loyalty, there are two. And in verse 6, we are told that this compromised faith, this lack of faithfulness and loyalty to the Lord was driving him away from his people. Do you see what's going on, God says to Ezekiel in, in verse 6? Detestable things the Israelites are doing here that will drive me far from my sanctuary. It's a blatant breach of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. There's this idol standing there at the very entrance to the inner courts of the temple. But not just is it a breach of our rule, it's, it makes impossible the kind of relationship that God wanted with his people. The Lord had pledged himself to his people, as in, for example, a marriage. But here, in open view, is a brazen hussy of an idol. So imagine a husband who tied his wife to a bedroom chair and he has her watch as he brings into the bedroom a, a string of other women that he has sex with while she watches on. He occasionally looks over and in fact at one point he, he gets up and he goes over to the, the wife tied to the chair and says, oh, it's your birthday tomorrow, I've, brought, I've bought you this beautiful necklace and he gives this necklace and, and lays it on her lap but then he goes back to the bed and has more women and a threesome or two and what is she supposed to think? As she's forced to watch in all of that, is she going to be thinking, oh, that's a lovely necklace, that's beautiful? No. The humiliation, the hurt, the anger that will be aroused. The, well, this is what God says he's feeling. The people are engaged in open prostitution of themselves as they worship this idol of jealousy. Verse 5. No pretense, no shame, clear, deep, and perverted opposition to the cruelest kind. And just as that woman tied to the chair would just love to be able to run, rush out the room and get away, so the Lord is saying, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm not going to watch this. this that's going to drive me away. 
Now, strange as that vision might seem, far removed as it might appear from our realities today, the impact of the detestable things, verse 6, and the godly heart and jealousy should hit us. It speaks to us not of the evil in the world around us, but in our own compromises, our own lack of loyalty. So, when God says, love your enemy, when God challenges to put us to put him above personal wealth, when he calls us to serve others enthusiastically and humbly and not just get together with our own mates, these and so on others, what are our responses? Is it loyalty to God or doing what suits us? Is it following God or pursuing our own agenda? Is our giving just a wee bit of an extra when we remember, or is it something that we consciously say, how much, what can I do for the Lord who is more important to me than my personal wealth? Which of us could read through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 to 7? Which of us could read through that sermon and say, well, yes, that describes my life? Those chapters have a lot to say about first loyalty, about exclusive service, about cutting off whatever it is that holds us back or causes us to sin. But when we say that we're Jesus' followers, but then live lives that are absorbed with priorities and idolatries of the world around us, then there is something detestable, something ungrateful and treacherous about that. Secondly, verses 7 to 13, via a hole that he's found and had to dig out some more, Ezekiel, through a door, is taken into a secret room where the city leaders are gathered. They think that all is in darkness, and so God cannot see, verse 12. The Lord doesn't see us. Perhaps the images on the walls that Ezekiel describes in verse 10 Perhaps their descriptions or depictions of Egyptian gods because the leaders were turning to Egypt for help against Babylon. God doesn't see us. God doesn't care. God isn't here. He's not going to get us out of this mess. Maybe the Egyptians will. Or maybe it wasn't something as organized as that. Maybe it was just a place where there was some clandestine meeting, where there was some rich man's club for rituals in a basement, some kind of secret society where the so-called respectable could gather to enjoy the tastes of forbidden fruit under a secret of secret cloak and under some hiding and hiding anonymously there. Either way, it's a sin that's repeated time and again the human scheming to try to advance our position irrespective of any principles or any God-taught truths. Been guilty of that as a nation, have we not? Things like siding with the Taliban to get the Russians out of Afghanistan because it suited us at the time, or backing the Shah of Persia because that was convenient at the time. And these unworthy alliances and many others have come back to bite us. Or not just in the nation, in the church, wanting to make it illegal, and making it, in fact, illegal not to attend worship as it was at one time. Churches elsewhere getting income from the taxes of the system, making other alliances with the state or with the privileged and the wealthy rather than relying on God. You see, what Ezekiel has seen here has been repeated countless numbers of times. And that's still the case if even what he's doing in these verses 7 to 13 is just witnessing some sordid secret society meeting. Behavior in secret that contradicts our public face. Something we despise in others. We are quick to point the finger, say, at politicians. Journalists are very quick to point these out. Often makes me wonder what skeletons journalists have in their cupboards. I suspect they're no better. 
And the church too has often been found out on many occasions, paying people off so that they don't cause trouble, not reporting offences, shielding perpetrators. Keep it quiet, hush it up. And at a personal level, which of us is immune from giving in to ulterior motives? Which of us has not been guilty of being one thing when nobody is looking, but different when others are looking? Let he or she who is without sin cast the first stone. And then thirdly, verses 14 to 15, Ezekiel is moving closer to the most sacred part of the temple, and he sees and hears a group of women mourning for Tammuz. Tammuz was a Babylonian deity that they, that they were now calling on, and calling on in the belief that through adoration to Tammuz, crops would grow again. And that was a further and deeper insult to God. God is the God of creation. God is the one who causes fruitfulness on the earth. And it was a robbing of his place to turn to Tammuz or anyone else in the hope that the crops would be good. Adoration of Tammuz was also tied up with adoring the beautiful and the sensual. Tammuz was a bit of a hunk, you know. And again, similar issues are around us in society and in the church today. A greater interest in creation in matters like climate change are to be welcomed in the church. But so often that goes further, and it's nature itself that is adored rather than the Creator. We imagine that our experience of God depends on stunning hillsides or whatever. We have imported beliefs and attitudes from New Age movements that compromise biblical truth. I remember being at a conference and some employees of the church just sitting there seriously talking about the moving around of stuff in the, um, the place of work, disturbing the feng shui. Goodness sake. In the church... We're simply going by the sin that appearance is everything, indulgent treatments, idolizing certain ways of looking and appear, appear, appearances, relationships based on how someone looks and so on. In a number of ways, our society and a compromised church has the contemporary versions of adoration for Tammuz. And then the fourth and final stage in verse 16 is in the inner court itself. Men with their backs to the presence of God, facing away from the Holy of Holies, bowing down to the sun, and as they do so, lifting their backsides towards God. Again, the sun was among the more powerful gods in the eyes of the Babylonians, but not surely for the people of Israel. And it's the religious leaders, it's the clergy who are doing this. Tolerating and embracing heresy has not been confined to Ezekiel's day, and is indeed rampant in today's church. Denial of miracles, denial of the resurrection of Jesus, denying that Jesus is the only way to God, these things are contested time and again. What must be going on in some church leaders' hearts and minds as they, for example, recite the Apostles' Creed? It's just a modern version of sticking their backsides into God's face. Now, these four scenes form a comprehensive condemnation of Israel's worship. The idol of jealousy at the northern door into the, the courts of the temples shows an openness of popular culture and movements rebelling. Yeah, we'll take this from that place. We'll take that. Yeah, whatever goes. The secret room, the privileged gather. In the inner court, it's the religious leaders. 
And both of these groups, the privileged and the religious leaders, would exclude women. But the third scene was of the women gathering around Tammuz. And the point is that it's in all of society, men, women, rich, poor, old, young, and all of these and more, Israel has turned away from the living God, has compromised or just simply outright denied the Lord and his place over them. And these false loyalties have spilled over into social disaster as well. The, desa- the detestable things, verse 17, have come and brought violence and so on. And so, verse 18, we're told that God will turn his back on them. And here is the beginning of a, of a series of warnings in these chapters that God is going to leave. He will be driven from the, the sanctuary. And so the third verse of chapter 9, the glory of the Lord of God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. He's on the way out. He's leaving it. Verse 4 of chapter 10, the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple until verses 22 and 23 of chapter 11, the glory of God departs altogether. The message to the exiles was clear. What is God doing? They asked, why has he let this happen? Why is there this destruction upon Jerusalem and its temple? Why are we all these miles from there in captivity in Babylon? Has God slipped up? Has God messed up? No. It's not that he abandoned his people. Rather, this is his judgment on them. What else should they expect given the compromises, the unfaithfulness, the cheap superficiality of their turning to God? Their worship is is, is slated in in chapter 8. There are so many different ways where they have turned to false gods and false values, and they've driven God out. Jerusalem was no longer the spiritual center of the people of God. The glory of God was for now relocated into a foreign land. Jerusalem was abandoned by God, and it was amongst the people of the exile that the hopes for God's purposes rested. Hence the vision in chapter 1, the glory of the Lord appearing to Ezekiel in Babylon. There, verse 3 of chapter 1, there in Babylon. Now, this eighth chapter of the book of Ezekiel ought to be sober reading for us in our post-Christian Western world. In our post-Christian country where church membership has plummeted, where the public influence of Christianity has evaporated, why? It might not be the inevitable process of secularization. It might not be the scientific advances that have disproved a need for God. It might not be the creeping materialism that has grown up around us and and choked out the need for God and religious faith. It might actually be the judgment of God. Too often, too shallowly, I've heard it said, oh, well, despite what's going on, God, I don't think, is going to give up on the Church of Scotland. Why not? He did it with Jerusalem. God is not tied to established structures Time and again when the church had compromised itself, time and again when the church had prostituted itself with false gods, God had raised up a people, a movement elsewhere. In the 16th century, the Reformation didn't start off trying to find a new church. But the structures of the time couldn't stomach the message of the Reformation that the Word of God was more important than the church traditions. And so they kicked the reformers out, and God had to start a new work elsewhere. 
couple of hundred years on when the, the Wesley brothers, they were church, solid, good Church of England folk until they were kicked out of the CFE because they were kicked out because the establishment couldn't cope with a gospel that was being preached outside their own buildings. You can't preach the gospel out in the fields. You've got to do it in a proper Church of England church. And so the Wesleys were forced out. The, the, the establishment couldn't cope with the gospel being preached to the poor and the poor turning to Jesus. The establishment couldn't cope with the message that the Wesleys were proclaiming that took discipleship seriously. And so God had to do a new work and a new thing. We have a good deal of repenting to do. We have a good deal of questioning of our assumptions. We have a good deal of soul-searching to do about whether, in fact, God has been thoroughly first in our lives. Secondly, as well as that repenting and that self-examination, we should be open to the possibility of God calling us to serve Him in and from exile. Not that we've been taken hundreds of miles to another country, but we are now finding ourselves growing up and going on in a culture that is certainly not Christian, a culture where the established links between state and church have long been removed and diminished. And the fact that a church is long established doesn't guarantee that it has a permanent title to the glory of God. Look what happened to Jerusalem. We need to keep up with what God is doing. And we have to be open to the possibility that if churches die, it might be for the long-term good of the whole church. The day may come when new fellowships will be built by a people more spiritually motivated than those who presided over their decline. A church that has compromised itself to fit worship alongside the other gods of the age Scene one. Or a church that has behaved differently in secret. Scene two. Or a church that is obsessed with materialism and appearance. Scene three. Or a church whose leaders are not faithful to God's truth. Scene four. Such a church needs to heed the warnings of Ezekiel 8. We can count on the love of God. We cannot presume on the love of God. And so both repentance and renewal should always be part of who we are and what we're doing and what we're about. It had become drastic in Israel's history until God had to step in and send them off to Babylon. It's way getting beyond the point of it having to be something drastic in our day and age, in our post-Christian society. When will we ever learn? Repentance and renewal. Not renewal of going back to what it was before, but renewal of serving God in the ways that He calls us to. Not Jesus is King and we've got all the power, but Jesus is your servant. And through service, love is made known. Repentance and renewal should always be part of who we are and what we do. Today's church is suffering because we forgot that. Let us pray.
Lord God, we know from um, Jeremiah, who lived around the same time as Ezekiel, we know from Jeremiah that there were people saying, oh, don't worry, that'll never happen here. God's not going to allow us to diminish. He's not going to have churches closing down. He's not going to, you know, do that here. And you did. You did because of the half-heartedness of your people. You, you did because of the blatant disregard for your word and your truth. You did that because in their spiritual adultery, they made it impossible, as it were, for you to remain in the room. Lord, help us to examine our own selves. Help us to be open to the possibilities and the calls to, to renew, to learn to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. And keep both repentance and renewal very much part and parcel of who we are and what we're about. And in doing so, to drive presumption and half-heartedness and compromise with your truth, to drive these away. Help us to depose the false gods of our era, to not to be taken in with the seductive lies of commercialism and so on. And Lord, help us to do that, knowing that in Christ the best is yet to come, knowing that in Christ you have more in store for us than we could ever give up. And so give us hope, energy, enthusiasm in coming to you and laying ourselves open to you and before you. In Jesus' name. Amen. A hymn which is a prayer for God to be doing that work of restoration and renewal among us. Restore, O Lord. After we've um, sung this hymn, we'll confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Um, and John Collard will be um, leading us in our prayers for others. And we will conclude our service with a hymn that poses that question of, of trust and fidelity to God, even when things around us are not to our liking and when things around us are not going as smoothly as we imagine that they, or presume that they might. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? But firstly, we sing the hymn, Restore, O Lord.
I believe. In our prayers now for ourselves and for others, we'll use the response, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And if you'd like to join in with that response, that may help you feel a part of the prayer as we share together. Let us pray. Lord God, as the unlocking from COVID restrictions continues we pray for decision makers, for politicians, and for the health professionals that advise them. They have difficult choices to make, trying to balance the educational needs, the economic activity, as well as concerns of physical and mental health. We pray for those who continue to feel themselves at risk and are anxious about what the coming months will bring as mixing increases. We pray for peace of mind and heart that they may take the precautions that they need. And we pray for those longing to be released from the restraints of recent months. May they enjoy the new freedoms while being careful of those around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in this summer of sport activity with the Euros, with Wimbledon and the Olympics, we thank you for the entertainment, the excitement and the emotion of sports. We marvel at the commitment and single-mindedness of sportsmen and women. And we call to mind the way that Paul the Apostle speaks of the Christian life as running a good race. For those of us who enjoy the passion that comes with supporting our teams, help us to do so always with respect and grace towards others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, when South Africa emerged from the apartheid years without major bloodshed, it was hailed as a remarkable achievement, even a miracle, a rainbow nation that pointed towards a more just future. Yet recent days have seen violence and looting on an unprecedented scale in South Africa. Ethnic divisions have been exacerbated adding to the long-term issues of inequality, poverty and unemployment. And so we pray for the President of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, and his government as they work to restore order as well as address the underlying issues. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In November, Glasgow will host the COP26 climate change conference. Around 30,000 delegates will take part in discussions that will build on the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015. Lord, we are among those who believe that the earth is not ours, but yours. And many faith groups will be represented among the delegates in Glasgow. We pray for that conference that it will be bold in advocating the measures necessary to slow down climate change and 
for governments across the world to legislate in ways that guard the life of this planet. And in our personal lives, forgive us for our failure to care for the earth as we should. Help us as we struggle to reduce the conspicuous consumption of our own daily lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The Nationality and Borders Bill introduced by the Government to the Commons in July will, for the first time ever, make it a criminal offence to enter the country by an irregular route. This, despite the 1951 Convention, which recognises that those fleeing from persecution may need to use irregular routes to travel to safety. And it seems hard to reconcile this with God's word to his people in Deuteronomy 10.19, which says, And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. And so we pray for compassion and kindness towards those fleeing from violence and persecution. We pray that our country would welcome those who are desperate to escape war and rebuild their shattered lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves, for our nearest and dearest, our family and friends. We thank you, Lord, for the bonds of love in our communities and families. Where those bonds are under strain, and conflict threatens to divide. May we be peacemakers. Help us to be among those who seek to listen, to understand, and to bless others, because that is what Christ has done for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these prayers we bring in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. In his precious name. Amen. Amen.